Hello and welcome back to another Torah Tuesday. Today we're going to look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1 has been the primary weapon in Christians' battle over the question of how God made the world and how long it took. So we're going to actually sidestep that question because I want to show you something in the literary design of Genesis chapter 1 that is really cool. It's a symmetry that's there that I didn't see for a really long time. So if you've already seen this, give yourself a good pat on the back for being ahead of the curve. But for the rest of you, I wanted to show you something cool. So there are six days of creation. And what you may not have noticed before is that days one, two, and three mirror days four, five, and six. So that on the first three days, God is doing mostly work of separation or separating one element from each other in order to create space for creatures to live. So, so days one, two, and three are create the creation of domains where the rest of the created world can flourish. And days four, five, and six are populating those domains and they correspond to each other. So on day one, God makes light and dark. And on day four, he populates the light and dark with the sun, moon, and stars. Have you ever noticed that before? On day two, God creates a vault to hold back the waters above from the waters below. So he creates air space so that things can breathe. Um, so we get waters above and waters below. And then on day five, which corresponds to day two, he creates fish and birds. The birds fly in the air and the fish swim in the water. On day three, God separates the sea from the dry land, creating a place for the the residents of day six, which are animals and humans, who then populate the dry land that he created on day three. So there's a really cool symmetry. There's a whole lot more I could tell you about that, but I want to highlight one piece of this correspondence between day one and day four that you might not have noticed before. So in the creation of the sun, moon, and stars, you might have assumed like, well, this, these are the, the bodies giving light to the world during at, during the day and at night. And of course they are, but there's a lot more to their purpose or function of the sun, moon, and stars according to Genesis chapter one. So in verse 14, it says, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times or festivals. We could translate that as sacred festivals and days and years. So before we even have humans, we have the creation of a liturgical calendar, a worship calendar in which humans can remember God's work on their behalf in the world. So that's kind of cool. Um, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. There's another thing about the sun, moon, and stars, which I find interesting. Um, God made two great lights, verse 16, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night, and we're told again in verse 18, they're to govern the day and night and to separate light from darkness. So these heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, and stars, are actually given a, a job to rule over the calendar, over time. They're, they're regulating the, the rhythms of human life before humans are even arriving on the scene. And then when we get to day six and God creates humans, he gives them a governing role as well. They're to rule over all the other created things. So in tandem with each other, they work within this rhythmic calendar that God's created in order to bring flourishing to the created world and all its residents. Such a cool thing. Um, if you're interested in exploring this idea more, I highly recommend this book by Michael Lefebvre, The Liturgy of Creation, Understanding Calendars in Old Testament Context. He shows, how, he shows us how calendars function in the Old Testament. And just to give you a taste of it, he says these are not journalistic notes. They're not, um, when, when we get calendar or date stamps in the Torah, they do, they're not functioning in order to tell us journalistically when something happened, but they're functioning to tell us when we're supposed to remember that that happened. That is when we're supposed to celebrate it as a part of our corporate worship. It's mind blowing stuff, really fascinating, carefully researched. I highly recommend it. And I hope you enjoyed that taste of Genesis 1. There is so much more here than what the church has been caught up in debating about. And I hope you dig deep, deeper and see more. Next week, I'm going to share a little tidbit from 
verse 21 and what God creates to populate the sea. And it's a little bit mind blowing. So join me next week. Drop a comment below if you want to interact with this at all. I would love to hear whether you've heard this before about the domains and residents of creation and have a great week.